Welcome to the 465th of the COVID Calls. This is a daily discussion of the COVID-19 pandemic with a diverse collection of disaster experts. My name is Scott Gabriel Knowles. I'm a historian of disasters at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. I'm coming to you live from Daejeon, South Korea. Today, I welcome Daniel Barber, Jeanette Kuo, and Paul Lewis to discuss architecture and design in the COVID era. Just a reminder, you can catch COVID Calls live on Twitter and on the COVID Calls YouTube channel. You can hear COVID Calls anytime recorded as podcasts on Spotify, iTunes, Podbean, or anywhere you get podcasts. You can also keep up with COVID Calls via Twitter using the handle at US of Disaster or at COVID Calls. Please help spread the word and send suggestions for future guests and future topics. Please don't wait too long, though. We'll be wrapping up the regular COVID calls on March 16th. As of March 11th, 2022, according to the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center, 6,030,745 people around the world have lost their lives to COVID-19. I've been reading an obituary or a story of advocacy for those impacted by the pandemic, and I'd like to continue that now. Italian architect Vittorio Grigotti dies of coronavirus is the headline. This was written by India Block, published March 16th, 2020, appeared in Tazine magazine. Vittorio Grigotti, the Italian architect who designed Palermo's Zen neighborhood and the Barcelona Olympic Stadium, passed away at the age of 92 from coronavirus. Grigotti died at the San Giuseppe Hospital in Milan on March 15, 2020. His wife, at the time that this obituary was published, was still being treated for COVID-19. The architect who founded his practice, Grigotti Associati International, in 1974, designed buildings including the 1992 Barcelona Olympic Stadium, Grand Theatre de Provence, the Archimboldi Opera Theatre in Milan, Lisbon's Belém Cultural Centre, and the Universita Picocha in Milan. Italy's Minister of Culture, Dario Franceschini, mourned Gregotti's passing, describing him as a great Italian architect and urban planner who has given prestige to our country in the world. Pirelli CEO Troncetti Provera said, with Vittorio Grigotti, one of the great protagonists of 20th century architecture disappears, who has also contributed to changing the face of Milan, projecting it into an international dimension, he said. In 1975, Grigotti curated an exhibition on architecture for the Venice Biennale, laying the foundations for the, for the establishment of the Venice Architecture Biennale in 1980. I agreed to do it only if we also had a small first exhibition of architecture, Grigotti said in an interview on the origins of the architecture festival. If not, well, I wasn't going to do it. The Biennale had never had an architecture section, so this would be the first one, he said. That year, he produced an exhibition on the abandoned grain mills on the island of Giudecca in Venice. The next year, Grigotti was made director of the Biennale's visual arts section, he used the role to expand the festival's focus on architecture further by putting on more venues with more architecture and design exhibitions. In 1978, as director of the Venice Biennale, he chose the theme Utopia and the Crisis of Anti-Nature, Architectural Intentions in Italy. Born in Novara in 1927, Grigotti started working at his father's textile factory at the age of 14. From this early experience, his interest in workers' rights and the collective interest led to him becoming a member of the Italian Communist Party. He pursued architecture following a visit in 1947 to the Paris studio of French architect Auguste Perret and his brothers. Back in Italy, he studied at the Politecnico di Milano. From 1955 to 1963, he was editor-in-chief of Italian architecture magazine Casabella. One of his most controversial urban plans was the Zona Espansione Nord, or ZEN, in Palermo. Built in 1969, Grigotti's multi-story housing for 10,000 people in an economically deprived area 
has become run down and is now synonymous with poverty and crime, so much so that director Marco Risi used it as the setting for his 1990 film Ragazzi Fori, or Boys on the Outside. In 2008, a secret mafia firing range was discovered underneath it. Mobster Salvatore Lo Piccolo built a warren of tunnels under the housing state, including a soundproofed 10-meter-long firing range with an air-conditioned hiding place stocked with a TV and cash. More successful was Grigotti Associati International's renovation of a stadium for the 1992 Barcelona Olympics, the Estadi Olympic Luis Companis. Grigotti gutted the structure, which had been originally built by architect Per Dominic Irura for the 1929 Expo. The facade was retained and new grandstands added to give it a capacity of 67,000 seats. It has remained in use ever since. In 1998, he built the Università Bicocca in Milan in an industrial area that was originally the Pirelli Industrial Complex. The critical reception of the campus was mixed, some critics complaining that it failed to make the area a cultural center. The studio has a strong focus on urban planning, designing an entire town in China, Pujang, a new town in Shanghai, which includes piazzas, a bell tower, and Venice-style canals. Principal figure, an Italian neo-avant-garde, Grigotti was also a respected architectural theorist. He focused on examining the modernist and postmodernist movements of the 20th century. He published many books, including Inside Architecture, which examined the theoretical debates on modernism and how mass culture has negatively impacted the environment. 2008 book, Contro la fine dell'architettura, dell architettura, or against the end of architecture, explored the question of the discipline's social responsibility. Milan, where Grigotti died, is currently on lockdown. Again, this was published in March of 2020 due to the coronavirus. At the time that this was published, the virus had spread, according to this, to 100 countries, and 6,500 people had lost their lives. This was published in March of 2020. Again, the obituary of architect Vittorio Grigotti, who died of coronavirus. Okay, I'd like to turn to the conversation for today. And I've really been looking forward to this. And we have a great group. Let me introduce everyone. Daniel Barber is Associate Professor of Architecture at the University of Pennsylvania Weizmann School of Design, where he's also chair of the Interdisciplinary PhD Program in Architecture. His most recent book is Modern Architecture and Climate, Design Before Air Conditioning, which appeared with Princeton University Press in 2020. He edits the Accumulation series on Eflux Architecture and is co-founder of The Current Collective on Environment and Architectural History. For 2021 and 22, is a senior fellow at the Kate Hamburger Center for Apocalyptic and Post-Apocalyptic Studies at Universität Heidelberg. Jeanette Kuo is partner at Karamuk Kuo Architects based in Zurich and professor of architecture and construction at TU Munich. Previously, she was assistant, assistant professor in practice at Harvard's Graduate School of Design and visiting professor at the Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne. Her work and her research focus on integrated design, looking at architectural space, technology and culture to address a more sustainable future work of her office ranges from collective housing to institutional projects for public clients and include the International Sports Sciences Institute in Lausanne, a low-tech sustainable office building, the Archaeological Center at Augusta Raurica, and the extension to the Rice University School of Architecture in Houston. And my third guest is Paul Lewis. Paul Lewis, FAIA, is a principal at LTL Architects based in New York City. He's a professor at Princeton University School of Architecture, where he's taught since 2000. Paul is the president of the Architectural League of New York and a fellow of the American Academy in Rome. His New York-based firm has completed academic, cultural, and institutional projects throughout the United States. LTL are the 2019 New York State AIA Firm of the Year. They received in that year a National Design Award and have been inducted into the ID Hall of Fame and have received multiple AIA Design Awards. The firm's recent work includes Poster House, the Helen R. Walton Children's Enrichment Center, and a new residence hall at Carnegie Mellon University. And the firm are architects of, most recently, the Manual of Physical Distancing, which appeared in 2020. 
Paul Lewis, Jeanette Quo, and Daniel Barber. Welcome to COVID Calls. Thank you. Thanks. It's great to be here, Scott. It was really fascinating to read that obituary. Uh, is Gregotti an architect that you all know? Yes, yeah. yes of course. And actually, <laughs> it, was, it was quite striking when you read that because um, I remember it is quite distinctly almost to the date uh, two years ago when, uh, in fact, that was the day before we went completely into lockdown here in Zurich. Um, so I still have that, that, that memory in mind. I was standing in the kitchen reading the news on my iPhone when I read his obituary. Um, so it's, <laughs> it's very present yeah. still. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I mean, that day, that, that's right, right around March. And it was such a brutal time in Italy, particularly at that moment. And those numbers at the end, that 6,500 people had died at that point. It seems like a different, mm, a different right, world. Right. Um, I usually start by asking people to just tell me where they're calling from, how the pandemic is, is looking there. Jeanette, let me start with you on that. Sure. Um, so I'm calling in from Zurich, Switzerland. Um, and uh, actually, just about two weeks ago, everything started to go back to, let's say, nor normal in the sense that um, we have uh, most of, I would say, the kind of restrictions lifted. Um, the only place right now where we need to be still wearing masks is in public transportation. Um, otherwise, you know, we're fully back in the offices, we're meeting as usual, and uh, there are no mask mandates in indoor spaces, even, you know, places where there's like supermarkets and uh, theaters and things like that. Vaccination wise, what's the situation there? Is it something that people even discuss? I don't picture uh, Zurich as a place where there's a lot of um, anti-vaccination ferment. However, I, I don't want to speak out of turn. Maybe there is. Um, you, you'd be surprised. I think Switzerland is very much about personal freedoms, um, but I think mm. there's a healthy balance, let's say, between um, a sense of responsibility and a sense of freedom. So, but, but you know, of course, it's the, it's the typical sort of uh, urban-rural debate, I would say. Um, and within Zurich itself, I would say we're very well vaccinated at this point. I mean, at least well enough that the government has considered it safe for us to be without uh, restrictions. Paul, where are you calling from? I am calling from early morning in New York City. Uh, and in very similar circumstances, it's actually a slightly more optimistic moment than, than normal, um, which is refreshing. Um, the, uh, you know, I was at a I was at a sold out concert, about 1500 people last night in Brooklyn for a, a band called Wet Leg, who's excellent in case you haven't heard of them. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was live, live music, kind of, Paul? What? Live music. I don't think so, I... Yeah, yeah. No, I know. It's, 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 <laughs> I know people don't know it, but it's really extraordinary. I mean, bands <laughs> perform on a stage. And in this case, with music, they haven't even released to something called Spotify. You know, it was really, uh, it was, it was it quite wonderful. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I, I I would say that the optimism is highly um, qualified by a like kind of lingering anxiety about mm -hmm. all right, can we be optimistic? Right? Is this you know? And if we are, do we feel guilty about that optimism? So, um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, it, it, I, we'll see where things go. There's a certain kind of optimism that people felt in in May of 2021 that induced them to do things like buy plane tickets and, <laughs> and make plans. And, and I think Delta and Omicron really has, has given everybody that, you described it very well, this sense of hesitation or qualification, as you said. I like the way you said that. Daniel, where are you? So I am in Berlin and I would say we're in relatively similar condition as Jeanette. I think there's still a bit more of a mask mandate in some stores and uh, certainly on public transit, but it's a bit less kind of all the time. And, you know, the end, I mean, the sun is out, spring is on its way. You know, I think there's really a sense of, just an effective sense of like, I, I hope this is over, right? Or at least it, it's some sort of pause where we can actually, I mean, this past wave has been, uh, I think partly just because I was so, you know, uh, strained from all the others, but it's been incredibly isolating, right? So I think there's a sense in Berlin of just kind of everybody's ready to run outside and enjoy the sunlight and have a good time. But we'll, we'll see if that, uh, if that persists or becomes one of those yeah, contingencies that we didn't quite anticipate, right? That comes back to get us. But, you know, for today, for today, the sun is out. So that's a good thing. I wonder how that, that European 
optimism is going to be tempered by the refugee influx that's mm -hmm. that's now coming. I, I don't know if you can see evidence of that either in Switzerland or in Germany already. Absolutely. Yes. Indeed. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, it's, if anything, it's 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 really more psychological as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think we've physically had yet uh, the arrivals. I mean, I, I've heard yesterday that some of our colleagues have brought uh, people over from Ukraine already, um, but. Um, you know, it's 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 not yet that that physical impact that you can see, but um, but we're all completely affected by it. Yeah, yeah, no, and we're very involved in some mutual aid projects here. I mean, Berlin is a major sort of landing point for a lot of refugees, and so uh, we've got a, a friend down the street who's preparing the, an extra bedroom to host, and we've kind of got a whole, you know, providing with dinners scattered around the neighborhood and so on. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of activity, but we're also kind of like, they're not here yet. <laughs> so right. I think there's still a sort of processing lag or, yeah. or um, so I think there's going to be a different sort of physical um, experience of it soon too. It's one other thing I wanted to ask you all before we start talking about architecture. I always ask my guests to share a, a personal memory of the pandemic, which I also call the impossible question because it's such a, a dense brick of memory in this time. But but I wonder if you wouldn't mind sharing something, an association or something that's happened that really stands in for you in this time. Daniel, um, can I ask you to answer that? Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, it's been a, you know, it's been a, a pretty intense couple of years, right? I mean, I, I think that what sticks with me most, um, my wife and I both got COVID very early on on a flight back mm -hmm. from Sydney, um, I mean, almost exactly two years ago, I think we arrived in Newark on March 6th and and uh, hers was very long lasting and that that's sort of experience you know whether it was long COVID or not right I mean part of the issue is we couldn't quite get it diagnosed right so that sort of experience of being ill surrounded by illness and being afraid to go to the hospital right because we kind of didn't know what was going on yet was the, the first I mean frankly you know first time in my 50 years a sort of crack of oh my God, everything's collapsing, right? I mean, just that kind of opening up of this possibility that says the world of tomorrow is not the world of today, um, you know, which I've contemplated in many ways from a sort of climate and apocalyptic perspective, but that sort of lived experience of it is I think something, yeah, that's really that's really stuck and it's sort of even kind of been a cloud, you know, sort of not knowing what to anticipate next. So. Um, thank you for sharing that. I'm glad you're, everybody's okay. Everybody's okay. Yeah, yeah, we made it through. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I know you to be a person who does think about the apocalypse from time to time, so it's quite, <laughs> quite striking to hear you ex express that sense of dread. Uh, and you're not the first yeah, person yeah. who I've talked to recently who's kind of said the same thing. I had a, a good friend, Amy Slayton, who was on recently. She said it was the first time I ever really knew fear. Yeah, mm. yeah, like yeah. like in a real way. Um, well, right, it's not fear safe that, to leave my yeah. house. Right. Yeah. The, the resources that we're used to are not there. So now, you know, and, and yeah. so what do we do? You know, where do we turn? What do we, and, and you know, we figured it out, of course. I mean, we, you know, we yeah. turned to the resources, yeah. but, but it was a, a striking moment. Yeah. Jeanette, um, same question to you. I think, you know, maybe, maybe the first sort of collective Zoom call that I had with friends mm -hmm. and colleagues, because I don't know. I mean, I think that it really was striking at that moment to realize how expansive this as a as an experience as a, as a kind of uh, condition was for everyone you know that it wasn't isolated to a place it wasn't isolated to a particular group of people it was everyone and that we were in this collectively and i think that realization sort of really hit hard at one moment where where we realized you know this is we're talking about also how do we prepare our you know further generations my daughter and you know her kind of generation of, of people for you know possible situations like this yeah well, thank you for sharing that and i i'm i don't know i have two children 10 and 13 and and you know we've all gotten used to a certain way of living but sometimes i get a shudder when i think that they've done two years like this without, you know, um, summers, without, you know, the various things, without just plain old time wasting, you know, it's, um, it's been quite a period of time in that regard. Paul, um, same question to you. I really thank you, Dan and, and Jeanette for sharing. Yeah, I, the, the, the memory that sticks out the most for me is relatively early on 
when I drove through the streets of New York to get to our office on 29th Street, we live on the tip of Manhattan, drove up and in the eerie quiet we, we all had kind of experienced, but to go through the city, hitting every light, you know, no, no trap, no one out. And just, and also just the eerie <clears throat> quiet of it all. Um, and then that contrast uh, to, I think it was about a half a year later where I was out in the village and with all of the outside dining, it was among the noisiest moments I've, I've but it noise in a different way. It wasn't car noise, wasn't the honking. It was a kind of socializing. And that difference I thought was really striking. The ability for, on the one hand, for the city to become completely still and quiet and completely unlike the Manhattan that I know or the New York I know. And then to within a relatively short period of time to have a different acoustic quality because there was a different way of occupying the city. And that contrast I thought was really profound. Let me just remind everyone you've been listening to COVID calls and uh, we're talking today with Jeanette Kuo, Paul Lewis and Daniel Barber. And uh, we're, we've got a lot of different time zones represented here and uh, thrilled to talk now about architecture and design in the time of COVID. And Paul, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn to you first. Your firm produced a, a pretty remarkable document early in the pandemic, the manual of physical distancing. And I'd like you to talk about it if you could. And, and I'm curious um, if you also could sort of set out the landscape for us a little bit in terms of ideas around physical distancing before COVID in terms of design. And then we can talk about, you know, what COVID brings to that discussion. Yeah. Um, so we had, we had, we were motivated to do this manual really from three standpoints. One is a lack of clarity about the very kind of science that was coming out and we were all reading about. So how, you know, spread of the virus, you know, what are the expectations for, you know, physical distancing, you know, is a meter the same as three feet, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, let alone two meters for six feet. Um, and that combined with the, you know, our interests as architects, like, wait, this is a spatially play, this would get gets played out spatially, what does it mean? So the kind of questions mostly about interiors, but then also, if one were to play this out in the urban arena, what might be the consequences of it in longer term? So, um, so those were the three things that we were looking at. And one of the things that 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 became quite clear is the preposterous nature of a six foot kind of bubble around humans in social settings, right? Um, and you know, let alone on a sidewalk, right? So even so, we and we knew that that in a sense physical distancing is already mandated in architectural interiors based on other kind of life safety factors, mostly fire, right, and egress. And, um, but they often correlate to kind of, nom you know, kind of psychological distances that we build into our own kind of, you know, daily comfort, which is to say when you're in a space that feels too crowded, it's probably exceeded the fire code. Um, mm. and, but six feet of distancing doesn't actually work in a social setting at all, as we all know, right? You know, the idea mm -hmm. you have a conversation with six feet, uh, six feet away doesn't work out. So we know that, you know, in a sense, this issue about, oh, you need to maintain six feet of distancing really got translated into you need to wear masks, right? The masks were really the, the physical evidence of that um, in social settings. But where we've seen kind of consequences are where there are, um, there are kind of direct tangible um, marking of those distances. And I, I use the office as an example, where a desk can be measured to be a certain distance. And that I think is, uh, is really interesting. So when you have mobility, you know, on sidewalks or in shopping malls or um, in places that uh, where six feet can't even be registered, I don't think it, it, it actually has had as much consequence, um, but where you can actually mark it out um, where it's not, it's less about distancing, but about kind of density. Um, and it gets inscribed into the architectural um, arrangements through furniture there it's had more consequences um we're also i'm also so super interested in in the utopian model of a of a city without cars or less cars or without the private car owning sidewalk or i should say parking space adjacent to a sidewalk that i think right. could, you know unfortunately we're seeing the opposite direction where more cars <laughs> and less public transportation but anyways uh, it's um 
I, it's still being played out. Well, there's so many different interesting factors of that. Um, what, one thing you just said really struck me as a person who studied fire, uh, you know, throughout my career. I mean, mm. those, um, you know, those numbers of capacity uh, for a building are, are about, you know, can we get people out? How quickly can we get people out? Whereas the those distancing requirements are, how can we safely keep people in? I mean, it's a, it's a totally different concept of what we're going to be doing with terms of density of people and space. I don't know, Jeanette or, or Daniel, did either one of you want to come in on this issue of physical distancing and how you were thinking about it either in your work or just following the different moves that were made early in the pandemic to try to do that? Um, well, I mean, I think that, um, you know, part of it maybe is also about giving us a, 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 uh, also a kind of flexibility in the way that we think about the spaces that we use so that we can be more in, to, to react, you know, to to these different conditions in, in different ways. Um, for example, you know, in the in the offices, in terms of different setups and different ways of um, organizing tables that it's not just about filling up all the spaces in the same way, but, you know, allowing therefore for differentiation and that that differentiation gives the kind of flexibility in the future to sort of adapt maybe more quickly uh, to these types of conditions. Because I think what we experienced basically also in our office um, with the kind of waves of COVID is that, you know, going into home office was wasn't a one-time thing. We had to do it, you know, back and forth, and and we were able to actually go back into the office several times um, during that period. But um, but there were times when we had to react relatively quickly. You know, we got the mandate from the government uh, with short notice, and then in the next day we had to go, go, you know, work back home again. And so the the idea of being able to sort of react more quickly to things, and you know, I think that also helps in a way to create the distance, at least on a kind of short-term basis. Well, Jeanette, what do you think that'll mean in terms of new construction? Are clients going to want to actually build some of this flexibility in with the idea? I mean, once you've experienced something like this, you don't forget it, even though you might think it's a low probability of return. Yeah, well, I mean, I think this is where it dovetails quite nicely, I would say, into things that have been or issues that have been coming to the surface and developing because of sustainability concerns. Um, and, and part of that has to do with, you know, how we think of our built environment, how we can make use of it the mo in the most ways possible, let's say, so that we get the most out of what we build. Um, and, and, and so I think the idea of what that means in terms of flexibility and adaptability is already something that was in the air. Um, and, uh, and that goes for the office as well as the home. I think that, you know, the, the other thing that was affected at the same time, you know, going back into home office meant that we had to adapt our homes in a relatively quick way to be able to handle all the different things that, you know, normally have their own spaces. Um, and so what does that mean, you know, in terms of the typologies that we are developing as as housing, as, you know, units? I mean, you know, this is, of course, here in, in uh, Switzerland, already a very, um, let's say, established uh, type of research in terms of uh, thinking of the different um, um, configurations and, and, and typologies of housing units and the relationships to the outdoors. And so that's, I think, a theme that will become more and more important as well. Daniel, let me bring you in if you want to comment on anything that we're talking about here in terms of physical distance. Sure. Yeah, no, I'll just say really quickly that I, I think that, and, and I think that, um, Paul's, uh, you know, the manual was really super helpful in this regard. I think one of the biggest aspects of the physical distancing issue, you know, which was so kind of loud and in our faces at the beginning, was just a kind of indication, right, that, uh, that public health has spatial components, right? I mean, just sort of that architects are part of this discussion or, you know, the players in the built environment are a huge part of this discussion. Uh, I, I like, you know, the way that Jeanette was just putting it, right? I mean, kind of how do we kind of think of the built environment differently and try, kind of try to see what we can get out of it in different ways. So that kind of aspect of adaptation, um, just sort of being in everyone's faces, right? And then, then it came back when it was more about the aerosol, which I think we'll get to in a moment, right? But I think that kind of specific indication that, you know, this is an archi a spatial problem, an architectural problem, I think was a, a big part of the first just moment. Yeah, let me just follow up on this for a second, you know, because certainly here where I am in South Korea, and I think probably in the United States, although I don't actually remember now, um, 
there were, you know, markings on the on the ground telling you where to yeah. stand in lines. And and you know, I don't tend to associate. I don't tend to think architects. Well, I, I guess I should qualify this, but I, I mean, it, you know, telling people how to act in a building or where to stand is not the role of the architect, right? I mean, you know, even the most hard-headed architects of mid. 20th century, I, I think, still didn't want to tell people exactly where to be in the building. Uh, and so it's a kind of intervention, because you mentioned it sort of a, in public health, discovering architecture and vice versa, Daniel. Um, it was just really jarring to see those, those kind of markings. And, and I wonder, you know, if that will also possibly have a, a life. I mean, I guess I keep coming back to this idea, and Paul was describing it earlier, this hesitation. I mean, there could be more variants. We might find ourselves in a situation like like this again, and and it was so heavy-handed to actually have markings on the ground in buildings and outside of buildings, telling people where to stand and how to orient themselves physically to a building. I, I found it so jarring. It's so interesting because I think that I think that there are architects who want to decide how people act in their spaces, but they <laughs> okay. don't want to do it with arrows, right? I mean, that's uh, that's cheating. Like you can't just tape an arrow on the ground. It's, you've got to walk into the space and you know, know where to sit or know how to, whatever. I mean, it's not, it's done through design, right? It's not done through signage. I mean, to speak far too generally, right? Yeah. But I mean, so I think I that think dynamic. I, yeah, so, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, please. Right. Um, yeah, no, I think that there's the short term. The short term reaction is obviously we need to, we need to, you know, uh, have these types of signs in order for people to, in this kind of, uh, you know, really intensive pandemic moment, uh, be able to, to react in the right ways. Um, but I think that the longer term impact is, is actually maybe more qualitative, more typological. Um, at least that's my hopes and that's my optimism. I think that you know some of the kind of questions that are arising and that again, already we're maybe in the air, but now can be accelerated, has to do with rethinking the way that we've been designing for example, our homes. <laughs> you know, in, in Switzerland, we're very lucky because the standard of demand, let's say, from a general public is very high. Um, an apartment usually has to have an outdoor space, a private outdoor space, meaning at least a balcony or a loggia. That's not the case in New York City. I mean, I, I lived in New York City for five years. Um, I lived in a place where uh, uh, or actually I've visited places where there was barely even windows, <laughs> you know, and and so the, the question of qualitatively, how would this affect the way that, you know, we uh, design, but also how the general public would demand a certain kind of level of, of, of space, um, and also how, you know, policymakers will take these things into consideration because, and or, or developers, that's because, you know, developers previously were really about um, the, the kind of economic factor that maybe is more defined from square footages rather than from the kind of qualitative aspect. Um, but if they realize, in fact, that the, the, the idea of an outdoor space as an amenity really sells way more, you know, mm. um, th that actually could completely change that factor. So, you know, the, the idea of, of things that we take for granted, you know, that this privilege of having, you know, that, that was for me, the kind of saving grace of, being stuck at home for three months during the, the first lockdown was we had a balcony. We had two balconies actually, so you know we were we were able to actually spend a lot of time outdoors. This was uh, also during the springtime, um, and yeah. and I think that idea of health, um, the relationship of of our physical but also mental health within um, the built environment, and how that relates, let's say in in a psychological. Uh, or, or let's say a mental sort of um, relationship between inside and outside, the kind of habits that we have between inside and outside. Mm. I think that's a very important um, aspect that will come to the fore. That's so interesting. I'm glad you mentioned the balconies. I mean, I was living in Princeton for the first year of the, of the pandemic. And of course, like everybody, uh, we were running a school, uh, office, a podcast, uh, historical research. And we had a, an old garage that I had already thought about tearing down and uh, it immediately got transformed into a ping pong academy. Um, and it was a, it was our refuge. And it was, you know, mm -hmm. leave the house, you move through the backyard and into that, that other space. And could, nobody could get to the coffee shop. So the, it was the ping pong garage. It saved our lives. I think it saved our mental health. Uh, Daniel, let me, um, 
Let me ask you about ventilation. And uh, you've been writing about that. You have this really interesting piece called Ventilation in the Long 2020. And so I know it's an issue you are interested in from a, a climate and sustainability perspective pre-pandemic. So take us into your thinking about how people started talking about HVAC and discovering those right, concerns right, right. as COVID emerges. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's been another way, you know, uh, as, as with so many ways that the, the pandemic has kind of revealed ongoing tensions and, and social and built environments and sort of helped us to see things a bit differently, right? I mean, I think some of those rooms that Jeanette was just describing, right? I mean, whether they're poorly windowed apartments or windowless offices, right? I mean, I, I teach in a classroom at Penn that's in the basement, right? That couldn't exist without air conditioning, without HVAC, right? Um, so I think there's, you know, there's, there's, once we began to understand the aerosol nature of the virus and, you know, how it moves and how it's communicable and recognizing that the, you know, the conditioned property, the, the air conditioning and the ventilation aspects of our interiors was an essential aspect of that, right? And, and so I think part of what emerges, emerged as a really compelling tension that we're still really working through is basically, well, is the answer sort of more HVAC or less, right? I mean, do we turn everything up, which, tends to be the engineer's solution, if I may be so bold, right? Or at least the kind of HVAC uh, industry solution, whether it's the engineer or not, uh, for many obvious reasons. Uh, yeah, do we turn it up or, or do we, you know, find a way to open a window or make a window or induce ventilation or find, you know, and I think that sort of basic question of, you know, how do we resolve uh, this current health crisis and kind of allow, I and mean, a lot of this was around schools, right? How do we get kids back in schools and, you know, we can't trust them mask all the time and distancing isn't as likely or possible. So, you know, open all the windows. And of course, discovering that a, a ridiculous number of schools in the US have classrooms with no windows or inoperable windows or other, you know, our the, the infrastructure of our built environment was not anticipating a moment when natural ventilation would have such incredibly salutary health effects, right? And I mean, it was 100 years ago, but it hasn't been in the last kind of 20 or 30. So I think, again, revealing that tension, right? I mean, sort of how we solve this problem exacerbate, you know, how we solve the public health crisis of the pandemic will exacerbate the ongoing public health crisis of the climate emergency. And so, again, a place where I think architects and designers and sort of, you know, people like myself who think about the built environment, you know, struggling to get our heads around this new reality, right? I mean, struggling to understand what the role of design, what the role of, uh, various forms of urban and architectural intervention might be in that context you know is the job to ventilate right should you you know right. can architects kind of sell themselves you know go and i will better ventilate your home without more, more carbon right i mean this becomes an interesting prospect so, um, paul paul let me yeah i'll just you in sorry on... just really one, yeah, one no, last ahead, quick Dan. thing is that yeah. that essay was for a, 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 a edited volume coming out through the 21st century studies center at UW Madison, and and also with essays by Beatrice Colomina and David Gisson, two of my kind of architectural historian colleagues who have also been thinking about these issues in very super smart ways. So certainly, people who are interested, look look them up. But, but Paul, let me give you a chance to, to comment. But one of the things that really struck me about the sort of ventilation conversation, as I was following it, was was sort of talking about current, you know, recently constructed buildings, but also. People having to try to get up, find the plans for old buildings. And I think it's a common problem with retrofits. But did, did you note some of that? I mean, it's a real fascinating conversations at my university. Like, what can is is this building safe? What is the ventilation system like in this hundred year old building? We thought we knew. Yeah. Well, I think there's. Yeah, I think one of the things that Daniel said, which I think is exactly right, is that COVID has intensified. Um, existing conditions or in an analysis of it, existing conditions uh, or problems or paradoxes in ways that um, are actually revealed that they're even more complicated. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think that the, 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 the degree to which the role, the question of fresh air, ventilation, heating, thermal performance, um, uh, starts to, you, you, depending on how you take each of these things, um, 
can be seen to be completely opposite. So for you know, one, one engineer and architect may argue we need absolutely rigid, uh, hermetically sealed skin so that we can control the amount of heat loss, right? Um, and that there that leads to this idea that the only way you're going to bring fresh air in is through very controlled and limited, the less the better, right? So clearly, um, uh, the, the demand for fresh air from the standpoint of COVID is now saying, oh, we need to open windows. But of course, that goes against the idea of energy efficiency, right? So, you know, and then you throw in the kind of, you know, embodied carbon anxiety about the building materials themselves. And most of the insulation is actually coming from petroleum products, which is, has a super high embodied carbon. So then you get into this, you know, can we have vapor permeable skins and how to, you know, I think it's going to all lead to a kind of thinking about a kind of um, skins that are more uh, adjustable, permeable, um, adaptable, but ultimately potentially also more expensive, right? So these yeah. these concerns start to magnify themselves in really complicated ways. Um, and I think it's, you know, in a strange way, this uh, renewed interest in it would be nice to open a window is hopefully going to have beneficial effects in the long term, but it's going to have to play itself out through many, many more complicated layers, literally, and maybe reducing some of those layers in the wall section, but that's another issue. <laughs> Jeanette, go I, ahead. I, yeah, thank you. If that's possible. Yeah, no, because it uh, brings up some really important uh, points. And I think um, one thing that I wanted to add to this is that, uh, well, there are two things. One is that, it, it again, it, it, it feeds into some of the 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 uh, things that are already in the air in thinking about sustainability and how we build sustainably for the future in terms of our reliance on mechanization um, and 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 kind of you know maybe um, maybe rethinking some of that um, that we've inherited in fact and 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 if we start if we think about it in fact it's it's kind of a self created problem you know the the last ten years or last twenty years of thinking about sustainability has been about how do we prevent energy loss, right? Um, efficiency is about energy loss, but it's it's it starts from a problem, which is why do we even need that energy, <laughs> right? There's a lot of uh, buildings that were built hundreds of years ago that actually are, you know, uh, climatically quite performative, um, but but you know are just functioning in a different way. That's the first thing. But the second thing is that um, we have been conditioned to think about comfort in a particular way. So our reliance is a cultural one. Um, when you go from place to place in the world, you, you realize, you know, for example, in Europe, we have very few buildings that are air conditioned. Um, in fact, um, you know, when I first moved here, I was very, not, very uh, not used to that because I was used to the blasting air conditioning in, in New York subways and New York City office spaces and things like that. And, and here, um, you know, we're, we're, we've learned to tolerate that there's four seasons <laughs> and, and that mm. we react by changing, you know, our clothes or by, um, by, by understanding that, you know, we appreciate summers more when there's winters and that, that, that difference is actually part of life. And so I think that um, what, what I wanted to point out a little bit is that there, there's things that will change on a physical level, but there are also things that need to change maybe on a, uh, on a cultural, on a, on a habitual level, um, one of them is, you know, uh, all, could also lead to sort of typological changes in architectural spaces. You know, some of the things that, um, for example, here in Europe, that that uh, in Switzerland is very common is is a thing called um, Waldschule. That's basically a, a forest school. So all the kids basically at least one day a week they go to the forest, and their classroom is the forest. Um, and that is a tradition that started in the 30s and 40s with uh, tuberculosis, right? That was a reaction also to, to a pandemic that had to do with aerosols and, and how, do we, how do we bring life to the outside and how do we live you know, with a better relationship to our environment and, 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 and not separate between inside and outside. So, um, so I think that, that that topic for me is much broader, in fact, than the technical one. Um, mm. it, it's actually a cultural one. It's a it's a habitual one. It forces us to rethink, you know, how do we how do we want to spend the waking hours of our life, and what yeah. quality should we demand for that to happen? I really appreciate that point. And and as a a native Texan, 
as a, a kid who experienced regularly what it was like to be very cold in the summer because my grandfather who worked for carrier air conditioning, this is my confession, Daniel, um, he insisted that the house be 68 degrees and that was just what it had to be. And, and, and so that was, you know, that, that idea. And of course we could go outside if we wanted to, but the house was a, was a fortress of controlled air. But there was no, at that time, there was no, if there was any discussion about climate change, I wasn't privy to it. I mean, it was it was free in a sense, if you could afford it. And, and I want to actually come back to your piece again. I want to quote from this um, ventilation in the long 2020 piece, Daniel, because you write, as we were stuck inside, isolating ourselves to decrease the vectors of viral transmission, minimizing contact, our built world intensified its reliance on the hard barrier of the building facade, what we were just talking about. But you write, the potential of the facade as an environmental filter is both an obvious solution to our ventilation challenges and seemingly impossible to enact at a scale that matters relative to the complications of viral spread and carbon dioxide emissions given HVAC reliance built into our environment. And you conclude this by saying, in mitigating one public health crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic, we exacerbate another climate instability. So I think that speaks directly to what Paul and Jeanette have both been saying here, Daniel. I wanna bring it back to you because what I've noticed here is those, the existential threat of climate change is hanging over all of this, but the urgency of COVID put such a strong pause on all of that. It is in a kind of a terrifying way to me, as if we had to choose one or the other. And I think you've said it very well in your piece. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, and I think that's a real, I mean, it's also, it, you know, I think it's real, dilemma, right? I'm in a kind of question of choosing one or the other. I mean, clearly we want to somehow attempt to manage both or or, or at least try, right? I mean, whether we've managed the pandemic, I think is an open question, but, um, uh, you know, but but I think that, that again, part of what's so compelling is, is, you know, I think a lot of the discussions uh, at the beginning of the pandemic about the sort of window that's opening and a kind of change that's coming and, you know, do we go back to normal or what's changing and, and what's continuing? And, uh, you know, I think no matter how much corporations sort of force people back into offices or whatever the kind of back to normal kind of rhetoric becomes, this, uh, you know, this kind of rupture has, has occurred, right? Socially and kind of socio-psychologically, et cetera. And, and, and I think that's the that's you know that's a, a sort of uh, crisis and panic and also opportunity, right? And, and and so I, which is to say that I think part of what's a good thing to me in my mind, right, is that is that I don't think that architects, I think the experience of the pandemic uh, and the intensity with which it changed the way that people work and kind of on the one hand just kind of helped people to see uh, different modes of interaction. Uh, but also kind of threatened or, or challenged a lot of assumptions and kind of uh, presumptions and, and even changed a lot of um, aspirations, kind of what people want to do with their time, right? And kind of along some of Jeanette's notes, right? That that I don't think an architect can sort of, you know, uh, see themselves as not being deeply embedded in the cascading social crises that we're all facing, right? And I, and, and I say that because there's been a kind of um, thread of architectural discourse that has quite explicitly kind of isolated itself from those social dynamics over the past few decades. And that's been breaking down for a while. But I think that this kind of power of the pandemic and the disruptive nature of it, and of, I mean, and just the catastrophic nature of it, I mean, the loss of life, right? I mean, the kind of very real experience that we've all had of, of, of yeah, of, of loss as part of this, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, helped us to see that, that the sort of role for the design fields uh, is changing, right? And it's changing pretty dramatically. And, and, you know, we're just trying to keep up. I mean, we literally, you know, the three educators and I mean, you know, architects and professionals in this room, trying to keep up with these changes and teach our students and, and in your cases, you know, serve your clients, right? In such a way that is attending to these kind of rapidly transforming dynamics of kind of what's 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 good for the future. <laughs> like, probably not what we were doing, you know, certainly not the kind of hardened supply chain of steel, glass, concrete, and air conditioning, right? I mean, that's something that we have to disrupt. But even more generally, yeah, I mean, do you open the window or do you ventilate more, right? Do you provide a space that's more open for social distancing or that's isolated for, you know, viral containing and containing the loads, et cetera? So really sort of challenging all of those questions. But but I think one of the things that has challenged, and it's been another sort of uh, background to a lot of this, 
and it's come up a few times. And I think uh, Paul, you said it quite nicely, and that we can kind of solve these issues with a series of you know permeable and adaptable skins and various dynamic systems. But there's a cost. I mean, there's a very real material and financial cost. And you know, as we saw in the pandemic, you know, it was much harder on low, those of, of uh, with economic challenges, right? I mean, it was a very inequitable response in terms of the health situation. And so I think we struggle with that as well, right? I mean, the, the, which is to say as a public health crisis, that the, the issue of climate change is, is not, and I'm not pretending, Paul, that this is any way, in any way where you were going, right? But the issue of climate change is not sort of, how do we design jewel boxes, right? To kind of, you know, preserve uh, those who can afford it, right? But how do we imagine a kind of equitable world where these questions of emissions and, and their uh, responses are more evenly distributed? And so I think those parallels with COVID are quite intense, right? Of sort of what are the, we can't, we're not just going to solve the problem in some sort of technocratic way that will uh, provide uh, new materials that will, you know, lead to some kind of absolute solution, but we're going to engage in these complications. I mean, kind of back to where Paul was, these kind of layers and layers of complications yeah. that will continue to be complicated and we'll just sort of do our best, but but it's a very different sort of mission, right? It's a very different project. And, and, and I think a much more, I don't know, I want to say realistic, but, um, um, a much more, uh, one that's full of possibilities, right? I mean, one that really uh, opens itself up to the world in a way that I think the field has struggled with. And, and, and I'm, I think it's in some ways a great sort of shift, but um, hard to adapt, right? I mean, hard to accustom ourselves to the changing dynamics under our feet. Yeah, one, one thing I want to pick up on is that I, I think one of the more um, kind of radical transformations that are, are kind of demanded of the uh, of what architects and designers do is to is to de-emphasize the visual, which is to say that you know we've you know and this is actually encoded in the way in which contracts are structured. The architects are responsible for the image in the United States. They're not responsible for the means and methods of construction. But a lot of what we're discussing viruses, you know, carbon counts, um, you know, questions of interior environment. These are non-visual, right? These are things that are not embedded in the aesthetics, if you will, the visual aesthetics of our built form, and yet they're actually they're they're con the, the the increasing importance of the non-visual is really shifting the agency of there or needs to shift the agency of architecture and design, um, and that means that you know climate questions are not so much aesthetic questions, right? These are questions of, of, of things that are invisible, like how you're constructing a building, how does it perform? Uh, what are the consequences of that performance? What about the kind of toxic emissions that are coming from all of the kind of plastic-based installations we're putting around our buildings to achieve energy efficiency? I mean, all of these kind of, these are, and frankly, most of the concerns about kind of uh, efficient performing buildings are invisible inside the wall section, right? So you get all these these kind of very, you know, strange agency shifts for, for an architect. And then you throw in the kind of questions of, of issues of equity and community. And these are often not played out in the visual realm. They're played out in terms of how, or, how, how you know, contracts and money are or organized. And um, I think it's a, it's a pretty profound moment for the design disciplines to deal with a, a real shift away from the aesthetics into things that are, and then that raises the question, well, mostly what we do is drawings, which play out themselves best through visual means. And so how right. do we actually make legible the very things that are invisible? Because we're not really good at that. So um, it's, a, it's a really interesting moment. Jeanette, yeah. I'm going to come to you. And, uh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, I, I think it's 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 fascinating because also you know what what I think is the new frontier and what's actually really for me quite optimistic about this moment is that um, in fact I think architecture has to think integratively between um, not necessarily technologies in the old sense of the term meaning mechanization but more in terms of how our buildings enable a certain level of performance um, and and that I think is something that we can experience it is something. Maybe it's not in the in the terms that we use to understand as visual, but it is spatial. Um, just one very kind of simple, you know, example is that a building of a certain depth can be ventilated naturally because you know you can open windows on both sides and you can ventilate it. Once you reach a certain depth, you know, let's say the large, uh, big corporate floor plates, no chance, 
Right. So, so I think there are ways in which we as designers can think about what form means, what space means, and how that relates to performance criteria that maybe, you know, allows us to go more low tech and be less reliant on certain technologies. Um, I think previous, previous um, generations have always been looking at technology as the solve all to these issues. Um, technology in the sense of, you know, again, more sort of mechanization and controlling and automation and, you know, things like that. And, and I think, and, and, you know, certainly here in, in Switzerland, we've noticed it more and more with our public clients. They're demanding more and more that we have buildings that have low mechanization. You know, we finished a, a building uh, for the campus at the University of Lausanne where there's very little mechanization. It's only the big, large uh, lecture halls, seminar rooms that are mechanized. All the other offices are naturally ventilated, um, yeah. and and I think if again if we if we start thinking about it on different terms, it has very very direct implications on the spaces that we design. You know the the proportions, the 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 ways in which we inhabit them. I got so into the conversation, I forgot to do my work here. Let me remind folks that you're listening to COVID calls and I'm talking to Daniel Barber and Paul Lewis and Jeanette Quo today about design and architecture in the in the COVID age. We've talked about, a lot about buildings here and about systems within buildings and the psychology of, of that and, and about risk and how people perceive danger or safety. Um, I want to talk about sort of city level, like city planning level kind of things here for a second. And Paul, your description a sort of Omega Man-esque description of Lower Manhattan in empty and quiet. Uh, and of course, that's a classic pandemic. It's very cinematic and, and also was very true. I, I mean, I think people experienced that in cities around the world. It was really jarring, but I think people also, of course, described the liberation of it too. And you, you hinted at this idea of, hey, what about a car-free Lower Manhattan? What would that what would that look like? And that, that also helps us address some of these problems we were just talking about. The potential for physical distance, adaptable spaces, healthier spaces, and oh, by the way, it happens to have climate adaptation advantages too. No one, so I always give this disclaimer, no one would wish for a pandemic for a global demonstration of what some have called the anthropause uh, and the car staying in the garage, but there we had it for a few months. So what did city planners learn? Yeah, well, the, the, the frust, I mean, look, the really frustrating thing about this is that the very kind of, um, kind of possibilities that were, um, were, uh, were put forward about, you know, thinking about the streets in particular in a different way, um, given the demand for more outside space and, for being able to say, or what we can't now gather inside restaurants, but we can gather on the streets, right? So um, that that you know, of course, has been countered by an increased use of the personal automobile, decrease of public transportation. I mean, that's and that's really that's the tragic you know consequence right now. So um, and I I you know I'd like to believe that there are lingering effects of a kind of renewed understanding that public space, particularly the space of the automobile, which is a huge portion of our cities, um, had be there's better uses than just sticking private automobiles on the street. But I'm not optimistic that it's going to actually have long term effects because there's such demands for using cars again. So it's I, you know, so there's there's the kind of utopian or kind of like this was potentially fantastic, but I'm not sure it's going to play itself out um, uh, in ways that that we might have hoped, uh, frankly, a year and a half ago. Daniel, Paul's in the less than optimistic. He didn't describe himself as pessimistic, but not optimistic. So there's some <laughs> space there. Daniel, where are you on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think of it more around the, um, I mean, I, I, I guess I should say I, I share some of Paul's uh, less than optimism around, um, you know, all the kind of interest and in, again, it's hard to say excitement, right, but kind of uh, compelling issues that emerged at the early moments of the pandemic that we thought were maybe new kind of structural conditions. And now there's a, you know, in many ways, a slow kind of retreat. I think to me, the more, the, the, the one that I'm sort of compelled by is, is how this sort of office home issue does or doesn't get resolved or, you know, plays around for the next decade or two. 
um, you know, because there's obvious, I mean, there's a lot of interest, a lot of things that could happen there, right? As we kind of explode those, uh, what were you know, very much kind of a, a dichotomous situation, um, you know, from the adaptive viewpoint, certainly, you know, obviously from the new build viewpoint as well, but also just in terms of kind of uh, lifestyles and habits and, you know, questions of sharing and, and, and community engagement. I mean, you know, part-time use of spaces kind of opens up a lot of questions. So, so I'm, I guess I'm, I, I share some of the frustration that I think, yeah, the car will persist and, and um, uh, someday, I don't know. I mean, will we ever, you know, uh, get rid of it, but, um, or actually maybe we'll rely on the kind of skyrocketing gas prices to, to do something there. But, um, uh, but I, I'm, I'm, Really curious, yeah, about how spaces are used differently, and and, and this kind of question of hybridity and sharing that, and, and sort of uh, the, the, the commons that begins to emerge in some of those discussions. But I know Jeanette's also been thinking about it a bit. So. Yeah, uh, Jeanette, I wanted to bring you in on on this too, because to talk about sort of the retreat from the office, because it also, I think, it speaks to that some of the things you were really talking about very eloquently before about you know getting away from more technical issues, and let's just talk about what the social benefit of being um, with your family more and that less was, time in the car yeah. and, let, yeah. and let design follow that. Let's just, and, and if downtown Seattle real estate markets crash, well, they probably won't, but, um, yeah. let's put these other values first. So my, so if I were to take the optimistic viewpoint, let's say, oh, good. And, I was and waiting for an optimist. Okay. Forward. I figured with three, I would get one. All right. <laughs> and project that forward in terms of the future of the city. I think my hopes is that there will be more, sort of locally based uh, ideas of communities and networks, meaning the where we work, where we live, how we shop, where we go, uh, the outdoor spaces that we that we use in between all of that is all in a much tighter um, distance. Um, partly, I think, I mean, at least in my own sense, I mean, I transitioned now up until the end of last year, I was doing commutes between uh, Zurich and the US to teach. Um, I've now shortened that commute. <laughs> I still commute, but to Munich, which is a, a shorter commute, but um, but it is also, a, um, it's a lifestyle choice. Um, you know, I think that the pandemic has forced a lot of us to rethink how we'd like to spend our time and what that actually means. And I think um, a majority of that has to do with live work balance. Um, can we, you know, the, the amount of time that I don't have to do traveling means that much more time I can spend with my daughter. And, and you know, the, the, the saving grace, also this kind of silver lining of that first three months of, of complete lockdown was really spending time with her. I had been traveling so much before that, uh, that I didn't actually have that, um, that chance. And so it was almost like a little, you know, pause button and in trying to, you know, rethink what, what, what do we need to do to find that kind of balance in our life again? And I do think that to a certain degree, you know, probably life will go back to normal for a lot of uh, larger corporations and things like that. But I do think that there is a, at least a small fraction of, of people, of companies that are beginning to realize what this means, that, you know, this flexibility of being able to move between home and office and, and also being able to accept um, different ways that employees will be in the office, meaning that it's not just always about the full-time, you know, office work, but really about finding a balance and maybe having shifts of people that use the office space. Um, maybe we'll, we'll cast a, a very different way also in terms of how we, how we will design our cities in the future. We have a couple of minutes left, and my guests were kind enough to agree to stick around for a minute. And um, I wanted to ask you just about the sociability of architecture and design a second, just about your own your own work communities a little bit. I mean, I think in some industries, people transitioned online. Uh, historians miss each other, but we spend a lot of time alone in the archives, too much time, frankly, alone in the archives. So for some people, some of my friends are like, hey, it's fine with me, you know, that's great, no more department meetings. I don't tend to think of architects as working that way. I think of big teams. I think of very social and lively offices. I think of, you know, city, you know, planning offices, very sociable, and of course, interacting with clients. Jeanette, I wanted to ask you first about this, just about how you adapted your own sort of styles of work with colleagues and with clients. Did you find it very disruptive or did you find a, a, a new way to achieve that sociability and um, creativity, space for creativity at distance? So, you know, I think that um, we've learned to be able to adapt to many different formats in quite and, and, and work in different ways, which I think 
again, is is probably a, a silver lining of this. You know, I, I have you know now a project in, in Houston where I used to fly there every three weeks or so, and and uh, since the pandemic, we've been doing everything online, um, but it's actually functioned pretty well as as well. So you know, I think that aspect of it is um, maybe not the not the biggest issue. I think where we maybe had a bigger challenge was within the office itself, you know, designing with our teams on projects, having that kind of fluidity and that 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 um, instance of of working together. Um, but we were also lucky that we we weren't ever completely, completely online. Like meaning after the first three months of the lockdown, we had shifts within the office. So, you know, teams were always one or two days in the office, we would go in to meet with them and then, you know, we would all be masked and 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 observe mm -hmm. that. But you know, it allowed different formats of working. Experimentation on distance and ventilation right there in your own office, of course. And that would make a lot of sense where you would start that. Paul, I mean, any of that resonate with how you were working? Yeah, I, I think that there, there's a lot of a lot of parallels there. I mean, one of the things, you know, we've got, we're, we're better at other tools and hopefully we can get rid of the flying, you know, all the way halfway across the world to present a, you know, two, you know, 30 minute PowerPoint, right? You know, so we've gotten rid of those kind of things. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do think that the, um, you know, architecture is ultimately a social act and socialization over Zoom is basically a kind of state of everyone being kind of distracted, um, except for, of course, this one, right, where we're all highly engaged. But no, normally it's just, you know, you're doing email as, as, as you're doing on the multitasking. And so, um, but, I, you know, I, I think it goes back to you if you combine these two things, right? We have very different ways that we can technically work and we have different structures of our uses of buildings in a city and different ways in which the city is. And I don't think it's played itself out. I think it's going to be really fascinating to see where the interrelated you know, issues of storefronts and shopping and use of offices and density and roles of home and the ways in which we figure out different methods of working, but that also has co economic consequences on where we buy lunch. Um, all of these things get mixed together. And I don't think that the consequences of the pandemic are going to be like fully known until, you know, we have hindsight of, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, um, even to the point that right now I'm having a hard time remembering what happened two years ago. Right. So I think it's going to be a, I, I, and I think it's uh, hopefully it's it gets um, used as an opportunity to rethink things in beneficial ways. Mm -hmm. well, we're almost up on time. I, I don't know if any of you are um, have done memorial designs before, but but I think to a certain extent we're all sort of memorial designers at at this point at, at all sorts of different scales. People have been thinking about how to mark time, and it really speaks to Paul what you were just saying. Two years ago, and I think we, you know, again to come back to the obituary I read, it seems so distant, and I really worry about that distance. I worry that this drive to normalcy, endemicity, um, the cars back um, in downtown, however you want to measure it. And Daniel, I want to ask you this first, but because um, you and I have talked about the Anthropocene together a lot, it ties into sort of bigger cultural needs uh, where I think we have to be assertive about memory. What do we need for COVID in that regard? That's such a, I mean, it's such an intense, uh, really important question. And, and I certainly won't, I mean, you know, I'm not a designer myself, but, but I do think that, yeah, how we um, social, I mean, you know, this sort of obviously goes far beyond architecture, right? I mean, just how we as a society, as a culture come to terms with, you know, what's been happening for the past two years. I mean, I think the, the the loss is, is immense and just beginning, you know, I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm still like hearing about sort of friends of friends and cousins and, you know, sort of various people. Um, so, so I, yeah, I don't, I don't, I guess I don't have any specific kind of solutions or even kind of trajectories except for kind of reaffirming the necessity for it. And even the kind of the desire to, you know, mourn communally, right? I mean, I'm, I'm, yearning for that. And I guess the one thing I would say is, you know, being Berlin and and having teenagers and spending a lot of time and being half Jewish and spending a lot of time talking about pasts and futures. And we spend a lot of time at memorials, right? And we spend a lot of time talking about the Holocaust and, you know, sort of broader questions, especially with the war a thousand kilometers away, right? I mean, sort of broader questions of 
of geopolitical and geophysical relations. And so it's just, you know, the, the, the power of, of Eisenman's monument, and I should say, as somebody who's not a huge fan, I'm happy to say publicly of Peter Eisenman, the, the monument to the murdered Jews of Europe is an amazing emotional experience and, and it's a truly yeah. powerful uh, space. And so I, I, I guess I, I look forward to those experiences of being able to mourn uh, in public with others. And uh, yeah, I look forward to what Jeanette and Paul and many others will come up with in that, in that regard. Paul, let me bring you in on that, but I think, Daniel, uh, I really value your point there about sort of the communal nature of it and the sort of iterative nature of it. And I and I think I worry also, I have a lot of concerns about memorials, but one is that we would rush to some sort of like national structures um, too fast, you know? So it's a balancing act to a certain degree because the way a lot of times memorials work, you have to get a foundation, has to get created, have to fundraise. There's a lot that goes into the formation of a structure and then it has to do a lot of work for a long time into the future so i don't want to forget but i don't want us to start making big monuments that will cease to be meaningful hmm. too soon paul i don't know if this is making any sense to you but i'm trying yeah. to find a way to talk about it. it it's a really interesting question i mean one of the things that's super tricky is that you know the pandemic was ev everywhere right and memorials mm -hmm. tend to want to mark a, a particular place that's distinctly different and how do you do that with a pa pandemic, right? Where, and so, you know, in a strange way, I think that the memorials are going to emerge by the stickers, the six foot stickers that were are left on sidewalks, right? That haven't been peeled up, that are getting more. And so that'll be the short term memorial, right? If there's a physical evidence that also kind of points to some of the peculiar, maybe, um, less than effective ways that we humans try to inscribe safety into you know, particular markings. Um, I, I think it's, I think the issue of the memorial and the nature of the pandemic are, are ultimately, uh, there's, there's a kind of friction there that, that will only be, you know, if there is a memorial, it'd have to be a memorial that's fundamentally different than any other memorial we've had. And I, I, I don't know what that would be. Jeanette, let me give you the last word on on this question. Thank you. So maybe maybe Scott, I think your your podcast might in fact be the memorial. Um, I, I, I'm 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 a bit hesitant to to think about a physical memorial. I think it you know similar to what Paul was saying. I think that it's um, it's difficult, and it it comes back to that first you know kind of. Uh, realization that I had when we, you know, when we all were in the situation together globally, and and it's difficult to kind of, you know, memorials that memorialize that in a in a in a physical sense. But I do think that one of the things, if I look back at, you know, some of the things that we've learned out of this situation, um, and the fact that, you know, we had very short term memory, for example, for the Spanish flu, which was, you know, something that also hit globally um, quite hard. Um, that maybe it is about narratives like this, you know, that, that it is about capturing stories and, and being able to kind of convey that to our children and, and the generations after of what's been happening uh, during this time. Well, if COVID calls can serve some function towards that, I'll be the whole thing would have been worth it. And I appreciate you, you raising that point. Um, we're out of time. I've been actually been very greedy with my guest's time today, uh, but uh, this was a great conversation. I just want to remind everybody you've been listening to COVID Calls, and you can usually catch COVID Calls live at 7 p.m. Eastern time, although these days we're doing COVID Calls pretty much around the clock as we lead up to the 500th episode on March 16th, and stay tuned at US of Disaster on Twitter for updates on that. And let me thank my guests, Daniel Barber, Jeanette Quo, and Paul Lewis. Uh, for your time today. It's a really interesting hour of learning. Really appreciate your conversation. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Good stuff. Stay healthy, everybody, and we'll see you next time on COVID Calls. <laughs>